and welcome to the Oddcast, the IKP podcast which brings you behind the scenes of a national touring theatre company. I'm Joe and I'm your host this week. I'm IKP's founder and each week we'll be joined by a selection of IKP members and theatre professionals. Joining me today are Nate, Kirsten and Ollie. Hello. Hiya. Tell us a bit about yourselves. Uh, So I'm Nate. Um, I joined IKP in 2017. So I was in Alice in Wonderland and Three Men in a Boat. And then last year, I was in The Wonderful Wizard of Oz as the Scarecrow. I'm Kirsten. I joined in 2019 in The Soul of the Stone. I played uh, Guinevere and the Lady of the Lake as well as other characters. I was also in The Wonderful Wizard of Oz as Dorothy. And I'll also be in next year's production of The Beauty and the Beast. Hello, I'm Ollie and I joined IKP as uh, the head of marketing. And I will be acting in Beauty and the Beast, which is the IKP's national summer tour. So (laughs) IKP uh, started in 2015, we're in our sixth year now, um, and it's grown more and more over the years. So it started off as a Gloucestershire-based theatre company, touring just to Gloucestershire, and now we perform as far south as Brighton. We're going to the Edinburgh Fringe this year, fingers crossed, hopefully it's all on. COVID looks like it's hopefully going to be letting us do that. Um, And we are doing four tours this year. The company is growing uh, and with it we feel like we'd like to give people a bit more of a behind the scenes view of what goes on which is why we're starting our podcast today um so yeah this podcast really is an opportunity for us to get together because part of the fun of ikp is that it's it's like-minded people coming together to put on high quality compact lo-fi shows um that are fun and enjoyable and more importantly that the cast are able to really enjoy spending the time together and having fun together so this lockdown that's lasted for the last nine years um has kind of stopped us being able to get together and put together theatre so this podcast is another strand where we can we can get together we can have some fun um and we also get to talk about some of the times when things haven't necessarily gone quite to plan as you would have expected them to um which i think personally is my favorite bit about doing shows is when stuff goes wrong i don't know about the rest of you guys like that's that's the main reason why people like IKP is because you you got like it's clear that you guys are having fun with 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 what you're working on like from someone who's seen your shows externally uh it like it just looks like a lot of fun to be in so yeah absolutely and that's I mean that's a lot down to the cast I mean Murray is Murray's been with us now for three years he started with us in Three Musketeers um and my favorite thing about Murray is that um you can see when he's decided he's going to do something a little bit cheeky because he gets a look on his face um, and and you can tell something's coming at some point, but you're not quite sure what's going to happen. Um, and uh, there was a point during Three Musketeers where one of the characters had to say who's here and accidentally said it like the Queen once. Like she walked in and went, <laughs> who's here? Um, and so Murray one day decided it would be fun to say who's here whenever he had an opportunity as Porthos, who obviously is the drunk musketeer. So every now and then you'd just get Porthos coming in and going, who's here? <laughs> um, and just having Murray there doing that's that's great. And the audience love it. Um, but I mean, when you've got somebody as good as Murray, you kind of give them free reign and yeah. just follow. Where did, you, uh, where did you find your actors? Um, so a lot of the actors are based in Gloucestershire. Um, And they come to us because they hear about IKP and they want to be involved. Um, So Murray, I I have known for quite a few years through the Everyman Theatre in Cheltenham. Um, He was in there waiting for Goddard. He played Lucky in that. Um, He was the assistant stage manager and understudy for their national tour of A Passionate Woman. Um, And he performed in a production of The Jungle Book that I was in as well. Um, And I also was uh, involved in a production of The Hand of the Baskervilles that he was in. Um, So I've known Murray for a long, long time, not quite the 25 years you said I've been acting for, but <laughs> a long, long time. Um, and he's he's just great fun. He's he's absolutely the best. And it's a it's a really weird thing because I I write the scripts for IKP. It's a really weird thing for me writing a script and knowing what I've written to be funny and what I've not written to be funny and giving it to somebody like Murray. And he reads lines that I didn't intend to be funny and just gives them this humour and this pathos and this character that I didn't intend. They were just a throwaway line. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's great giving him lines like that and letting him play with it. My, my favourite thing that I've given Murray was um, in The Three Musketeers, 
I, I, I like to hide Easter eggs in the shows. So people that saw uh, the wonderful Wizard of Oz this year, a lot of the audience didn't notice, but there were the odd person that would come up at the end of the show and they'd tell us that they'd noticed that all of the lyrics from Toto's Africa were in the, in the Wizard of Oz. They were spoken at some point by one of the characters. Um, so that was hidden in this year's show. In The Three Musketeers, um, I gave Cardinal Richelieu, who's the big bad, he's the bad, he's the main villain in, in Three Musketeers, and he's a particularly nasty man. Um, I snuck in quotes from Disney villains. So Murray was stood there really seriously saying things that, like, Governor Ratcliffe from Pocahontas would say, or that <laughs> Ursula the Sea Witch from The Little Mermaid would say. Um, without any clue he was doing it but I so I used to love it every night standing there listening to him go they're not like you and me which means they must be evil um, and thinking that it was this really in-depth like detailed character analysis and I just put a little easter egg in from Pocahontas from the song Savages um, that always makes me giggle. Where did Joe meet you Curtin and Nathan then? Yeah so um, I was part of a local youth theatre and um Joe was the person that like assisted my group when I was like 14, 15 and was basically like, oh, this is good. <laughs> this is great. So when I was 18, he was like, hey, can you like, do you want to come and be in the show? And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, so that was Alice in Wonderland and um, Three Men in a Boat. And <laughs> oh, yeah, it was, it was a fun one. Um, it was really, I was really lucky to be given the opportunity to do like a show, two shows in rap as well. Like, for someone at 18 it was really helpful to be like okay well, this yeah. is what i'm doing and get to work with other people and like i mean joe's writings developed a lot but even then it was really helpful by having a funny script and being like okay well i can actually try comedy because it's something i always kind of shied away from as a yeah. teenager um so yeah i feel like in that sense joe's really helped me grow just because i've learned to be funny did you find it like difficult going from say like a youth theatre performance like straight into working with professional actors on a professional tour like without any kind of um, not really but I think that's more to do with the fact that I take everything way way too seriously so <laughs> my little two hours on a Thursday night youth club I came in on the first rehearsal knowing my lines and be like I'm gonna get this right I'm gonna be perfect I'm gonna push myself and like took everything way way too seriously um but yeah, so I, I don't think the transition was too difficult just because I think, um, like I was, especially at that age, I was very like, I'm going to like soak everything up and learn as much as I can and like push myself. So I think yeah, also, no. you, I think you also had the, the, the benefit, I think that um, Vinny, who ran your, your youth group, the one that I assisted on, Vinny ran the youth group like a professional company like they were expected to come in and perform in the way that they would in the professional company and Vinny has worked with IKP Vinny was in the first two years of shows um they were in Rip Roaring Summer Adventure they were towed in the Wind in the Willows um and then they directed Musketeers for us so they they really knew and they really understood and they got IKP um and the way that IKP runs was very similar to the way that, that youth theatre run ran so I think it, it it was a really good fit because Nate was so well trained in the kind of theatre that IKP do because Vinny is such a good teacher. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Fair enough. And then what about you, Kirsten? <clears throat> um so I'd been at uni for a year and I hadn't done much acting and I'd I don't know, I kind of hated it by that point. Um, yeah. and then I was going into my yeah I was going in no that can't be right. yeah that's right. Sorry. I was going into my second year. Wait you um, hated and I didn't did you hate the uni course or acting, sorry? Uh, so, oh, it's a bit of a half and half course. I did a course that no longer exists um, at the Griffith right. School of Acting, which was also a part of the University of Surrey because it was an academic course. Yeah. But um, it looked, it's called theatre performance. So it was a bit of acting, a bit of like backstage, but mostly academic and looking at all those things. Um, and in my second year, I did pure like theory, just pure academic stuff. Um, and I think I, I got like two months into it and I was like, I really miss acting. I miss it so much. And I said to Nathan, Nate, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Um, I said to him, I was like, I want to get back into acting, but I don't really know what to do because I picked like all theory modules this year, which I loved, but 
I don't know. I just I wanted to get back into acting, and Nathan was sorry. I'm going to keep calling him Nathan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nathan was like, "Why don't you ask Joe? Like, why don't you ask him to audition?" So I was like, "Oh no, like they're a professional company. They're not going to take <laughs> yeah. me on." Um, and then I messaged Joe, and he was like, "Yeah, sure. Just message me like in the new year, and we'll look into auditions." So I was like, "Great, sick." Um, messaged him in the new year, did an audition with Joe and another member of the company, Cal. And yeah, I was really scared. <laughs> I was so scared. <laughs> I hadn't acted in like literally like over a year. So I was so nervous, but I don't know. It was really nice because Joe offered me the job like after the audition. So I was just absolutely buzzed. Um, and yeah, it was just yeah. really nice. I think that's like, that's like the good thing about IKP though, is that um, I think a lot of the industry at the moment can be very, um, like I feel like there's a lot of gate- gatekeeping going on. Like you have to, you have to have either attended like, a pr- really prestigious school or know someone in the industry to get in and so I think like personally from what I've found with IKP is that it's based on like talent and how you work with the people like from what I've seen anyway rather than uh you know like what school you went to or what what grades you got what what course you did and I, I think that's I think that's really important going forward because like like I said like the industry is really saturated at the moment and so it's it's difficult for like really talented young people to get in at the moment because they're not given those opportunities they're not given that chance to like step up and like it like it's 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 really clear to me as well that um that that's that's such a bad thing because like look at you Kirsten for instance like like you said like you've you've gone out of acting you didn't you didn't get much of a chance with it and then you went into IKP and then two shows later like uh, you're getting like critically acclaimed like personally mentioned in the stage like you, you yeah. d- you've done you've done really well for yourself and like you, you didn't do you didn't go to um a BA acting at a drama course or something you 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 followed your own path and you you still managed to become a professional actor from it oh thank you um <laughs> oh, it, <laughs> yeah, just like, spitting facts <laughs> oh thanks thanks babe um yeah no the thing that put me off acting was an acting teacher I'm not gonna say obviously but it put me off um just didn't get good feedback or any feedback for that matter and like it was just a bit of a mess like I said it put me off it really yeah. put me off um but yeah I don't know joining like doing the sword in the stone which I did in 2019 like I've said to everyone that that gave me like a I don't know like the motivation to want to do it inspired me to want to keep doing it because it yeah. was just so much fun and like working like even though ikp has a lot of members working within a small like tight knit group of people when you're doing so much and um yeah it just it's i don't know it's different to doing like a big massive tour with loads and loads of people which is also fun but i don't know when you're when you're with like three other people or four other people every day it's just different like the relationships are different the dynamic is different and that's what makes the stage dynamic what i think is amazing like i think ikp has got incredible relationships between their actors and stuff just because we do have those relationships i don't know yeah. I'll just repeat I, myself <laughs> yeah I, like i think there's a there's something really special about a group of mates getting into a van and then like chucking all the set and costumes and making everything fit in a car being able to tour <laughs> together and like um like it, it's the getting up at six in the morning to drive to Brighton to rehearse a show to then do a show to then sleep for like eight hours get back up have breakfast go and do two more shows and then drive back that night yeah that, like really intense process is like I don't know it's 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 hard work it's graft but like it's um, fun it's just yeah fun. it's so much fun yeah like, and I- not every day is like that obviously but the days when it is like that we're not like oh god we've got to get up like I mean we are a bit like that but like yeah, but that's because we're know. actors, so that's <laughs> mornings aren't our thing. <laughs> but yeah, it's just I don't know. We have fun in the car, like I don't know. We all get yeah. along. That's the thing. We all get along. There's no like tension. There's no like weirdness. Like we're all mates at the end of the day. Even if we weren't mates beforehand, we we just I don't know. Joe's really good at picking the right people, and I don't know. Everyone just gets along really well. It's really really fun. Yeah, and I think that's like that's like the kind of thing that. Uh, personally for me like makes or breaks theater it's like you can you can tell when there is tension like uh in a cast and like it, they just don't gel together as well but like i for, for me like again like watching ikp externally like you, you can see how well you guys get on like you can tell that you're all friends and that you bounce off each other and that's why and that's why it really works with like the style of theater that joe's 
gone for with like um, being able to just like riff off each other, like a really flexible script that uh, means that you're getting a, a unique performance every night because you guys know each other so well and you work together so well with each other because because you're mates. Like you're you're not doing you're not there just for a job. You're doing it because you enjoy it and you can you can really tell that. Yeah, absolutely. How did you get involved in IKT, Jay? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um i i don't really know i kind of fell into it to be honest um like so joe um initially asked me for like a little bit of like marketing help on the tour um so like for wonderful wizard of oz because I told him that his social media was rubbish, <laughs> basically. I like and how he... you started off by phrasing that as in, like, Joe asked me for a bit of help, as opposed to I muscled my own, my way in by saying that the marketing was just <laughs> No, I did. I was just offering professional advice. <laughs> and, I, and I massively appreciated the help because the tour sold out, like, I mean, 100%. So, it, like... <laughs> Big disclaimer, we were in the middle of a pandemic. and Yes, but also, big disclaimer, not in your favour. We were in the middle of a pandemic, and you still <laughs> sold out at all. I, mean, I, I think people are quite entertainment star, but, like, the thing is, like, IKP have been established for, like, what, five years already? And so you, you've got, like, a good cult following. I find it, it it's really weird, like, um, from taking over the, uh, the social media pages, like, you just see, like, diehard fans for ikp it's so mad like we have we have a few followers that just like share everything that uh we post like, they're so lovely about it and it's like you you can tell that you can tell how much they love ikp like <laughs> just because of how much they share they bloody love it if we had like yeah. i know it's it's really nice it's but really i nice think I, I think interestingly that thing that you say about that you guys have said about picking the right people and it being like a, a like it's friends getting together and it's like it's a community of of people the the followers who are like that for us for ikp are, are just the same like they're part of that family still it's it's interesting seeing year on year the same people coming back and bringing friends like when there's there's people that come to some of our venues like there's a there's a couple that came to hillside brewery two years ago um, when it was our first day, our first performance there, and we got a, quite a small audience, but that's what you expect from a first year there. Um, and they came back the next year and brought a few friends, and then this year they came back and brought even more friends. Um, and and they come up and say hi at the end of the show, and you start to recognise people, and it's it's really nice that there's those people who who are part of the the experience, and it's it's not just like that they feel that they know you like they they come up at the end and we go i recognize you 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 came last year it's so nice to see you again and it, it is really nice having those people back um and and i mean we've we do get it's it's nuts we get people who have we we got a new venue because somebody came to see us in glastonbury and then booked us in leeds and it's <laughs> it's that kind of interconnected thing of setting up this network across the country where it's really nice to to meet people who enjoy the same kind of thing as us because also there was a bit of a disclaimer with the way that I write the scripts and the way that I like the show in that they're nuts and I write them and I'm like nobody else is going to find this funny this is just my head being stupid and then people <laughs> sit there and laugh at it and come up at the end and go that was hilarious and I'm like you're nuts too it's great <laughs> <laughs> well the better like actually like it's funny you say that because like that's probably like my favorite thing about your scripts is that uh, you you just you put so much humor into it and honestly i'm i'm a bit of a thick person myself <laughs> and so like i'll 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 find like the first performance funny and then i'll watch it like because obviously I'm, I'm going along with the tour and so like i'll watch it like four or five times and i'll enjoy it every time because there's always like another joke or something that i didn't understand that just like suddenly clicked for me that one time and so like it's like watching a new show like every every time my favourite thing is whenever you come to a show, Ollie, and you're at the back, and then no one laughs, and I'm just <laughs> Ollie, <laughs> right at the back. Yeah. I'm just aggressively like laughing in the background, just like please it's laugh. It's great. <laughs> it's so reassuring. It's like, oh. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, it's always nice when nobody laughs. Yeah, I mean that was a funny thing about doing a show with a socially distanced audience is. Yeah. Like usually you get a laugh and it, it travels because one person chuckles and then the chuckle's funny and then like that just 
But like when there's a two meter gap between audience members, one cut, one person hears a reference and goes, huh. and no one else around them hears it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they don't realize there was a joke. Um, yeah. So yeah, like socially distance audiences can be really hard work. But like once everyone does laugh at something, you know, you've really got them on side. It's a weird like you're throwing it into the void, but then like suddenly the void gets a life of its own. <laughs> I felt I, that... some little... oh. Sorry, go. Sorry, there's also some locations though where like the laughs will be a bit quieter or a bit more like just subtle across across the audience, and then like you'll have loads of people come up afterwards and be like, "That was amazing! Oh my god!" And you're like, <laughs> "Was it?" Those are the ones where you get to the end of the show and they come up and you're like, "Oh, that was awful! They hated it. It was just it's the worst." Or you're like at the interval going, "What can we do to get them on side?" And then they come up at the yeah. end and they're like, "We loved it," and you're like, "Did you?" <laughs> oh, okay, cool, good to know. I mean, I mean the, this year was this year was a really weird one because of being socially distanced, and I found it really interesting having been outside and being like, do you know what? They're just not getting some of these jokes. Some of these jokes are going over people's heads, and they're just not hearing them, and and they're just not working. But they're there, and we're enjoying them because sometimes I put jokes in that are just for me, um, and. And, oh my. and thinking that those jokes have just gone for nothing and then you get to like we went indoors for the everyman we we got a couple of extra performances at the everyman in Cheltenham and we went indoors and because it was indoors every noise could be heard like you could hear people getting their tissues out or readjusting their mask or or whatever they were doing in the auditorium but it meant you heard every single laugh and it meant we were stood on the stage and people were laughing at jokes we hadn't left pauses for because we didn't think people were laughing, but clearly they were. But it was one of those, <laughs> it was one of those, it's like it's like that Mary Poppins scene song where she's talking about how different people laugh in different ways. That was the most theatre reference I could make. So <laughs> I didn't um, know that reference. So like <laughs> they sing they, they sing that song about uh, it's the one where they're all floating up on the ceiling and they're singing about I love to laugh and they sing about some people laugh through their noses and some people like laugh out loud and some people snicker and stuff. And it's that interesting thing of like being at, on stage indoors, listening to people go <laughs> at a joke where they've not done it out loud in a field and because they've not done it like really loudly they've just done it quietly to themselves we've gone oh nobody's getting that joke we'll just we'll cruise through it um and then it turns out they probably have been and we've just kept going with the show because we didn't hear them um which is which is a really interesting one for me that people enjoy such different things to themselves like everybody finds something different funny in the show um but I, I love those ones that I write thinking nobody else is going to find this funny. This is this is an in-joke for me. Um, and then somebody laughs in the audience and I'm like, oh, do you get it? That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to say something, Ollie, and you've stopped talking now. Sorry, um, I did actually take a quick break to go grab a drink. Um, <laughs> my drink's covered. It just, just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was listening. I promise. <laughs> But my headphones are slightly too, like the cable is slightly too short, and my dress pants are just there, so I took a quick trip. Um, uh, yeah, I don't remember what I was going to say now. Oh, that was it actually. Um, I was going to say, going back to like your point from like five ten minutes ago um, about your um, your jokes that you slip in just for yourself. Like, there's one joke. I, I, if anyone who's listening, who, like, have seen a ikp show before there's always a joke in um one of the shows about uh, a lady called marjorie and a tombola and i have seen i've seen these shows for like i've seen like the last four shows in a row and he always slipped it in and i had no clue what it was about i thought it was like a cheltenham thing i didn't know whether it's <laughs> i thought i didn't know it was like some kind of in joke with everyone in cheltenham i had no clue but um it I, I don't even know the story, really. I still don't really get it. So if someone could please explain it to me. I mean, the story, ironically, the story relates back to Vinny, who we were talking about earlier because they taught Nate's um, youth theatre class. Um, so I, oh, I, I don't even know how to start this. So when we were touring with Home of the Baskervilles, I was taking off a pair of gloves um, the way that posh people do, apparently. So I, because I knew I had to put the gloves on later, took the gloves off by like pulling each of the fingers off separately and then pulling the glove off so that I could put the glove back on more easily. Um, and Vinny 
was like, what are you doing? That's not how you take off a pair of gloves. And I was like, yes, it is how you take off a pair of gloves, except posher. Um, and, and Vinny was like, no, it's not. And turned to one of the other actors who was in the show and just went, take off your glove. And he like brute force grabbed the bottom of his glove and yanked it off his hand so it was inside <laughs> out. And Vinny was like, that's how you take off a glove. And I was like, yeah, but um, okay, whatever. So from that point, Vinny was then like, very aware of the fact that I do things like a 70 year old lady who goes to the WI on a Wednesday night. Um, so, so like every time they would, I would say something posh, Vinny would stand there pretending to take off an imaginary glove and like pulling at the things of it. And, be like, <laughs> um, and then we, we went to, we, we went to a venue. It was, it was, I was doing the tech for the show. It, in fact, no, I wasn't. I was understudying for Vinny because we were doing Sherlock Holmes and uh, uh, with another company, and Murray was in it actually. Um, we were doing Sherlock Holmes. Vinny had a bad back um, that meant that they were in like crippling agony. So I was normally doing tech for the show and I learned the part and went on for Vinny. So we were at this village hall in the forest um, and I'd brought the lighting along and everything and there was no internet. So it wouldn't connect up to the uh, the box that needed the lighting box. This is a totally unrelated story. I'll get back. Sorry, this is just what I do. <laughs> it's um, so the, the computer wouldn't link up to the lighting box because the lighting box needed a patch update, which needed to connect to the internet. And we couldn't do it because we were in, like, we were in the sticks. We were in the middle of nowhere in the forest. Um, and so it wouldn't do it. So um, I, I was on and Vinny was was doing tech so we swapped basically um and we were in like imagine village hall two light switches at the side of the room and it's got like those flickering fluorescent light strips in the ceiling so we had those on the ceiling and we had a desk lamp on a table at the front of the stage um <laughs> basically Vinny had to run the lighting for this whole show by turning on and off these fluorescent strip lights um and using and like turning the desk lamp on and off at the wall so if we wanted like dark mood lighting we'd have these desk lamps um this desk lamp and if we wanted like ceiling lighting we'd have the fluorescence but every time they'd come on they'd do that flickery kind of not quite on not quite off and then settle so you're trying to do a show basically in a in a community sports hall um which was just it was it was funny but it was also the most like embarrassing thing that any of us have ever done but anyway so in that same hall underneath one of the tables at the edge of the room while we were setting up the stage for the show there was a tombola a properly a proper old massive like wheel up tombola with the big handle on the side it was like red uh, with a hatch that opened it was a proper wi raffle tombola <laughs> under the table and murray went oh there's a tombola under there and I, being sarcastic, like making mm -hmm. fun of it, went, mm -hmm. well, of course, you can't have a raffle without a tombola. Vinny instantly turned around, got their hand up in front of their face, started pulling this imaginary glove off by the fingers and went, oh, and I said to Marjorie, you can't have a raffle without a tombola. Um, and ever <laughs> since that, that quote has just been in all the IKP shows. And ironically, I forgot to write it into Sword in the Stone. Um, it wasn't in the script. Um, and Murray remembered halfway through rehearsals and was like, you haven't got it in there. And I was like, um, okay. And then there was a point where Merlin and Arthur were walking on stage into a conversation that was already happening. And the director, Greg, was like, you need to be doing something. You can't just walk in. It's weird. And Murray went, I know, and came in as Merlin going, well, I said to Marjorie, you can't have a raffle without a tombola. So he saved my bacon there because it's been in there. <laughs> since the very start it's been there since 2015 um and i nearly missed it but i didn't yeah. but that's that's all down to vinnie i mean there's a whole range of quotes that that link to that one there's also and i said to marjorie they change their stock far too often if you ask me um <laughs> which i actually did say genuinely that wasn't even a sarcastic comment that was while we were lifting furniture into a different village hall but yeah so that's there 
I realized I massively screwed you over there by trying to get you to explain a story where you had to visually show how you took off a glove. I really appreciated <laughs> how you're like, I took it off poshly. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I was I was demonstrating all the way for my did, own benefit. So you did like, very well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> was, yeah, sorry for the tangent. I realized right. that I, I go off on tangents all the time. I think this is why people oh. struggle with my scripts quite a lot is because like I write them because it just what is it's what comes out of my head. And a lot of the time people are like, I don't know how to make the link from this thing to this thing. And I'm like, why not? That's really logical. And they're like, no, it's not logical at all. It's two completely different things. Yeah. I would argue the opposite, though. We've had this conversation before because I've said about how I don't know how you can like talk to like one person about one thing and then you can like cut off in the middle and have a full blown conversa- com- conversation with someone else <laughs> for 10 minutes about something else. And then you'll go back to the other thing. And like, if it was me, I'd forget. I'd completely forget. No idea what's going on. But you just think you can just keep like five different dialogues going on at the same time. And like, I don't know. So I disagree with that. <laughs> okay, yeah. <fine. laughs> and I wouldn't really say, I wouldn't necessarily say your scripts or anything are like rambly or ranty or waffly or anything. I think they're quite the opposite. I think rambly might be a little bit adequate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I just think like um, I think, I think the best I mean, parts of the shows are always the bits where Joe's finally been able to get away from the plot and it's like oh i've actually got a page where i can write what i want to rather than having to follow a plot it's not um, i mean i mean to be fair we um <laughs> i do choose i do choose stories that don't really have a plot i mean when you read <laughs> when you when you actually read the book of wizard of oz or alice in wonderland you're like there's nothing here like that you re- you watch the film of the wizard of oz um and the wicked witch of the west is there for the entire thing i mean she's mrs gulch before she before dorothy even goes to kansas and then she turns up the moment dorothy arrives in in, uh, sorry before dorothy arrives in oz i used to do this all the time during the show i prefer to (laughs) oz as kansas and then be like oh no wrong place whoopsie you did that Um, i did yeah i did (laughs) (laughs) as glinda yeah Um, (laughs) whoops um but yeah but mrs but the the wicked witch of the west is there all the way through in the film and then you read the book and she turns up on like page 97 and dies on page 106 and you're like but this is like the big bad of the film. Where's she? Where's she gone? Um, but yeah, the the I do tend to choose books to adapt that there's a lot of free space in. Mm. I mean, Beauty and the Beast is is our next. No, Treasure Island is our next. But Beauty and the Beast is our <laughs> next summer tour. Um, and Beauty and the Beast again is one of those books where you go, oh, we'll do that one. I know that story, and then you you pick up the book to read it and go, well, we'll we'll adapt the book because otherwise Disney will sue us. Um, and so you you pick up the book and start reading it, and you go, oh, <laughs> this is a totally different story. Like there there is not a singing teapot, and there's there are monkeys and parrots and pirates and all of that kind of stuff, and it's. It's a really interesting thing, kind of trying to find a way to weave through a story that doesn't have a huge amount of te- like plot to it, and the plot that is there think- when you start adapting like the thirteenth century French romance novels that are about arranged marriages probably shouldn't be adapted or kept in for a modern audience. There's there's a lot of kind of stuff that needs adapting, um, and I get bored of stories anyway. I like to mess about. Yeah, I was literally going to say that. I think the fact that you pick those stories and that you can get rid of those things that don't fit and just are just wrong now, you can change that and you can use that to just play about and have fun and do what works with IKP. I feel like that's what brings it together. And like, I don't know, if you were just doing original stories, it'd still be really good, but it, they would be original stories. And I don't think that's necessarily what IKP is. I'm not, I'm not even experience. sure it would be an original story. I think it would be just an hour of people messing about on stage. I'd probably write <laughs> yeah. a, I mean, when I, we did Cinderella this Christmas and there was, there was genuinely a stage direction that said, Prince Charming chooses a member of the audience. Prince Charming makes up a song about the member of the audience. <laughs> Prince Charming Amazing. exits. And like, just because I was like, why not? It'll be fun. Um, yeah, that was that was a fun one until somebody 
what was it? Somebody called Deborah. I chose somebody called Deborah. And I was like, nothing but zebra rhymes with Deborah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's not much you can do with Deborah. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's what's gone most wrong for you, Kirsten, during a show? Oh my god. Oh my days. So many oh my things. Days. Oh my days. Oh my <laughs> so many things. Oh my god. Oh, just so many things. I've forgotten lines. I've had blank moments where I'm just like, I'll just stare into the distance and hope for the best. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Um, when we were at the Everyman, the floor was really slippery and my shoes had no grip. So my shoe fell off in the tornado scene and I had to just get it back. <laughs> uh, that was a bit embarrassing, but it was fine. Um, how, do you re- how do you even like recover from stuff like that though? <laughs> I'd have no you idea just forget. what to do. You just, you just get on with it but like i think it's the fear and like i don't know i think by that point especially like by that by the time we got to the every man once we've done like 24 shows or something stupid and like i don't know you just go in character grab the shoes slip it back on whatever move on i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't leave it there's no way i could have left it i'm trying to think of other things that have gone wrong they definitely have oh i broke a teacup once oh my god <laughs> <laughs> so merlin Merlin, do you remember? Merlin has a magic scene where he pulls like teacups out of his sleeve. <laughs> yeah. And prior to that scene, they're put underneath these crates. And I was sat on one of the crates and they weren't set up properly. And I just leant on a crate. The crate fell, smashed um, smashed a teacup in, I can't remember what the theatre is called. It's the one in um, Oxford. Water Perry. Perry Gardens. Oh, Water I was there Perry, for yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. That, oh, was, the, that was the show where I forgot the sword. Yes. yes. Oh, because yes. My, yes. because my, oh, my, my car God. broke down and we the, the sword was in the boot of my car and we moved everything into Ollie's car and we ended I ended up having to borrow um the master sword from the Legend of Zelda, which was hanging on my ex-wife's wall. <laughs> and I had to borrow that and we ended up with this like anime blue <laughs> curved like Japanese manga style sword, which was really sharp. Just like stuck yeah. in the set. That was a good day. Yeah, that was a that was a good show. Yeah, yeah, so that was fun. <laughs> so you had to glue a, a, t- no, a thing back together, a teacup back together. But we also had to go and get because you did even. I think you were already halfway to Water Perry when you realised you didn't have the sword, and we were just leaving Cheltenham. Yeah, we and were. I think you oh. like messaged or called one of us. Yeah, and we were like, oh, so we're gonna drive <laughs> to your ex partner's house <laughs> <laughs> and get this sword. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was good yeah was that what that wasn't the one that we had to go indoors for as well was it did we go indoors yeah, for that no. one? that was it the was year before that, I can't think it was the sword in the stone at waterbury it's a it's a beautiful theater it's a like a stone arch- um, amphitheater with a, a wooden flooring and then you go out the back of the stage and it's just this this like tunnel that everything's stored in it's, it's such a beautiful venue to be at and the staff there are all so lovely um but it's it's we did musketeers there and it rained and during the second act we were like it's just miserable out here so we're going to go inside um which we don't do very often like we very rarely will take a show indoors but it had already been misting for the whole first act and the audience genuinely looked like they could happily kill us um (laughs) and so we were like we're gonna go inside because it's just getting heavier so we took what we could inside which was like the backdrop and a few screens a few props but we went indoors and um we took the swords in but only used them for like the final fight because there were kids sat about three feet away from us we didn't want to hurt anybody um and we accidentally ended the show a scene early because i hit the ceiling with my sword and the audience started clapping because they thought it was the end and we were like oh okay We'll, we'll stop there then. Great, thanks. Anyway, sorry you were saying. We didn't have much luck this year either, though, because the set fell on you and me. <laughs> I forgot about that. That was a water <laughs> I cried. Honestly, we were, we held it together so well, though. Like, I didn't even know it was the gasp of the audience. And then I think we both side-eyed and we were like, oh, no. I, mean, <laughs> like, I, I, I knew because it hit me on the head, but oh, it was fine. <laughs> I love Water Perry. Love it there. It's yeah. gorgeous. I've got to like be somewhere different every single time I've been there. But like, 
I don't know. It was so windy. It was so windy. <laughs> That's, that is like that. Uh, that is probably I think the worst part of doing outdoor theatre is just like the weather. It's so hard. Like um, especially with the wind. Do you remember that one time in? Well, actually, it happened multiple times. There was that like, one time in Hillside Brewery where the gazebo, where they keep all of the props and stuff. And you came in and just knocked on the dressing room door like, um, ex- excuse me, everybody. Um, um, the se- I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but the, the set has flown away. You've got no set anymore. It's gone. <laughs> uh, like, did- why did you knock? That's one of those <laughs> run into the room and be like, the gazebo's gone. I didn't well, know then, you guys very hey, well. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'm terribly sorry to bother you. There's a, oh, whoopsie daisy. Oh, no. I didn't know I right, so I didn't know like um everyone very well. So I was a bit I was quite new and so I didn't want to disturb them because I thought <gasps> they might have been like rehearsing or something in their dressing no. room. <laughs> no, not I, outside. So like I just knocked politely and was like, Oh guys, please, um because the gazebo's flown away, so can you come out please? Yeah, and then we go outside and there's this one guy, bless his heart, holding this massive gazebo, like struggling for life. Oh my god, it was so funny. It was so so funny. And I, I feel like we and made that we away. made that joke every single day though, after that. We'd like knock before something really like joke serious <laughs> would happen. <laughs> Sorry, Ollie. And it and, it, and it went miles at Museum in the Park as well, didn't it, that day? Oh, and that, God. that wasn't a good day for us as well because that was no. the day that we were supposed to be indoors and obviously because of covid it moved us to a different venue so thankfully abigail at museum in the park who is yeah. just an absolute lifesaver she's just amazing she's great. But like we, we moved to the museum in the park and then there was no wind it was non-existent so we were like it's fine gazebo's up sets up it's fine went inside and the gazebo just went flying was that the was that the day where like the storm just came yeah. like, really suddenly? Yeah, yeah and, it was. And it and it somehow managed to like go like around yeah. the park. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was it. That was that one. And you had to sit in the gazebo and just hold things down because <laughs> it was so windy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, was that the one where I like sat on a prop or something and so something? Yeah. Was... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come and back. I was like, where's the golden cat? Where's the golden cat? <laughs> Wasn't that the one where you started trying to help by tidying up stuff that we were done uh, with yeah. and started packing everything away that we needed? And then my fat ass was sat on the golden cat. <laughs> I mean, that golden, that golden cap was never where it was needed to be. Like, every time I had to come back on as the winged monkey carrying the golden cap, I'd be like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? No, I haven't got it. And I'd go back on sometimes. And I'd be like, this golden cap and hold up just nothing. But we give it to you. <laughs> Except I didn't, because that would have looked awful. But yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I feel as though like you need to put that in your um in your like job description for future actors. Like, must be able to like deal with things going wrong. But it's I mean it's the it's the case with outdoor theatre, isn't it? You you everything is in one gazebo, and yeah. Well, I mean we we could. We could be a company that turns up and builds a main stage set, but I'm it, personally I don't I don't want to. I I love the creativity of storytelling from being minimalist and from going. You've got like with three men in a boat, we had three chairs and a trunk that we shoved everything in, and we went. If it doesn't fit in the trunk, you don't have it. It doesn't exist, and you have to create the you have to create the world of the story from that. And I think that's really important. I think it's I think. Other, other companies um, really strive in and kind of bring the world of main stage theatre to an outdoor venue. And that's 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 not that's just not what I like to do with IKP. I like to I like to do imaginative storytelling through the creativity of being minimalist and through the creativity of encouraging the audience to be engaged and to join in with what's going on in the same way that we are a family theatre company. But I I've told you off many times, Ollie, for calling us a children's theatre company because <laughs> because I don't think we should talk down to kids. Like I, I love the fact that kids who are four years old come along and enjoy something like the Three Musketeers, spoken in full sentences and not not broken down at all for them, and they enjoy it and they understand it. And, and yet yeah, they might not get the political complexities of it, but they they still understand it and they still get it. And I, I think that's really important for a theatre company that's teaching families how to enjoy theatre without needing somebody to compromise. Yeah. 
because there's a lot of as as somebody who has kids there's there's a lot of children's theatre you go and watch and you sit there in the theatre and as the parent you sit there going please tell me this is going to end soon because I can't handle this anymore yeah and yeah I think kids know when like they're being talked down to as well like Mm. kids are a lot smarter than people realize like I think like you like you uh, well I've so like I've got a foster brother and um and so like he watches CBB, CBBs from time to time or whatever going completely off tangent and you, like I'm sat there watching it with him and he like he, he he gets bored really quickly because not to diss CBBs but like <laughs> yeah let's sorry. take on one of the major British corporations sorry CBBs <laughs> if you're listening it's just not to my taste so he'll be he'll be watching it and he doesn't um, like he do- he doesn't really enjoy it because he he knows that he's being talked down to, and he's a he's he's a lot more intelligent I think, and most kids are most kids are a lot more intelligent than people realize, and they they do understand uh, like more complex jokes. You don't have to talk down to them in order to in order to get them to enjoy a show, which is again a, a really good way um, a good. What am I trying to say here? Um, it's a really good thing that IKP does. Yeah. Yeah, I, just, I, mean, I think it teaches... Oh. No, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I think it teaches them respect in a different way. I think it teaches them that they're just as important because if oh. their parents are laughing at something, that they're also finding funny. But also, not even just that, if they're laughing in a play and then their parents are also laughing at another point, then they feel like, I don't know, it's not, I don't know, do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it shouldn't be something that's separate. It's something that should mm. be enjoyed together. And I think yeah. that's something that IKB does really well because yeah. I don't know, the families will come up to us afterwards and they're like, oh, we brought our kids to this, but we lo- we love it. We're going to come back next year. We're going to bring our friends. And that's how it develops yeah. because it's not just for kids. It's yeah. for everyone. And, that, and that's my favorite thing is that you get groups of adults who come without kids and they still love it. Um, and I mean, I, I, but it, it's funny the way it appeals to all ages and sometimes I don't quite understand the way it appeals to all ages. Like there's, there was, a, we did, the year we did Alice in Wonderland and Three Men in a Boat, which was Nate's first year with us. We, like I did those two because they're such different audiences and Alice in Wonderland is very much bring your eight year old girl to see it. And Three Men in a Boat is very much older couples come and see a show. Um, and I was completely wrong. It, it, it was great because it completely broke down my understanding of what the target audience was because like for example my my oldest who is nearly nine came and saw that show and he absolutely loved Alice in Wonderland is fascinated with Alice in Wonderland loves the story loves the strength of the main character all of that and three men in a boat like we did a show where where a couple brought their four-year-old to it which was great slightly awkward because the three main characters got down to their wife fronts in the show um <laughs> that was awkward um but the f- that family at the end spoke to somebody and were like that was great all three of us loved it and it's it's that thing that like i i didn't write three men in a boat expecting a four-year-old to come and enjoy this quite old-fashioned like edwardian romp along the thames where I've, I, I mean, it's not even just that we got down to our wife front. I literally ripped Meg's dress off her during that show outdoors, which was really mean. Um, it was part of the show. I didn't just do it for the fun. Just to clarify. <laughs> just to clarify. <laughs> um, We're very but, like, close. There was, there was a lot of underwear in that show, and it's quite funny that people brought kids to that, and we were like, we, we made it quite clear that this is not expected to be a family show, but people did. Um and it was, I mean, it was in the stage where we didn't have a particular following. We didn't have people who knew us for doing family shows. So it didn't, it didn't make much difference. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's really interesting the way that young people would come and see that show and would still take enjoyment from it. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's, it's that, it's that, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm rambling. It, well, um, it makes, it makes um, stories accessible for, for kids as well, because a lot like especially um like myself personally i i'm not i used to be a big fan of reading and then i kind of dropped out of it uh and i know that there are a lot of kids who feel the same you know maybe they have um just like a disinterest in reading and stuff so it, it by putting it into theater and making it accessible for all ages it allows them to embrace 
uh, really important stories for them uh, to understand and know about just in a different format if you know what I mean like yeah like I didn't really know I'll be honest I didn't really know the three musketeers I didn't <laughs> sword in the stone and how old was i when i joined ikp 21 Jesus. <laughs> um, <laughs> i didn't know them i mean obviously i, I saw three musketeers before i mean i'll but... be honest you still don't know three musketeers if you've only watched the ikp <laughs> three musketeers because it was not the three musketeers plot yeah but it gets no, but still yeah like, i didn't know and like the thought of reading that like with all due respect no i just it's not me it's not a bit of me um and seeing the show it was funny i enjoyed it and i took something from it and i think that's what's important like it just it's for everyone it's for everyone <laughs> it's it's funny as well when you when you think about these these family shows like shows that you think of that as a family film i mean they did they did a i think it was a 12 maybe a pg even with logan Lerman and orlando bloom a few years oh, ago i love that film but i mean it's that book is not family friendly partly because like spoilers Milady de winter gets beheaded by a river at the end of it like they oh, describe yeah. her getting her head cut off how do you get but beheaded also, by a river sorry beheaded beside a river oh beside <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> i was like bloody hell no. just the thames with an axe <laughs> and, and constance who's d'artagnan's love interest through the whole thing gets poisoned at a convent not by a convent and not by a nun um but it's like it's heavy and but also so regardless of that the political stuff is just like you you have to understand french political military history to enjoy it i think yeah i don't know i didn't enjoy it um but so <laughs> but, but it's it's that thing of like three musketeers is one of those things that people think is family friendly and is appropriate and you read the book and which i did because i decided i was doing that show and went great i'll read the book and it was a mistake um and but so i read the book and i did an adaptation of the book and i sent it to Vinny, who directed three musketeers and they like Vinny and i know each other very well so it was fine they replied just going what do you think of it? And I went, there's a few things I'd change. I'm not sure about it. And they replied going, maybe have another go. <laughs> and I was like, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. And they were 100% right. Like They were absolutely correct. And I yeah. had another go. And the, the other go that I had, I was like, I'm just going to, I'm going to take the bits of the plot I want and I'm going to throw everything else out because it's it's not a value for a family audience. And also, I can't behead a character on stage while there's five-year-olds watching. Um, and and then, I mean, it's not that difficult to achieve. I, I watched it. What did I watch it happen in? Like, uh, it happened in Tale of Two Cities, didn't it? When you two were in, Nate and Kirsten, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, you were both in that. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> um but yeah that happened i mean i you it's possible to do on stage it's just a bit of magic which we did loads of during wizard of oz wonderful wizard of oz um <laughs> but yeah it's but it's it's funny the stuff that people think is family friendly and then you read the book and it's just not um but uh, yeah it's i i don't like reading you've read more than i've in the last year no that's not a lie kirsten it's not a lie at all i hate reading and I, at some point, will learn to stop saying I'm going to adapt shows that I haven't read. I would love to do an adaptation of things like um, Narnia, but C.S. Lewis, unfortunately, hasn't been dead long enough for me to be able to have the creative license to do an IKP thing to it that I'd like to do. Um, because to do a free adaptation for something to be in, in public domain, the author, unfortunately, has to have been dead for 70 years. Um, and I'd, I'd love to do a, a straight adaptation of Narnia, but it wouldn't fit the IKP brand. So unfortunately, I need stuff to be public domain so that I can make it ours and we can possess it and inhabit it and make it something that our audience find um, and our audience enjoy. Because I think we fit a bit of a niche corner of the market. I don't know if that's my ego speaking, but. Yeah, if oh, anyone what? has any suggestions for that, please yeah. let us know, please. Like a comment section. <laughs> Just please <laughs> let us know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, we, we were talking earlier about stuff that had gone wrong during shows for Kirsten. So, Nate, 
But what about you? Have you got? Um, I think I think the most obvious one because um, there's something I did in Three Men in a Boat, the Benny and Wonderful Wizard of Oz, the entire summer haunted me, uh, which was I totally forgot about this. That <laughs> I started scene <laughs> five or six around scene two or three. So there were two points where we started talking about camping. The first time, we just have a little conversation that we might go camping and then we do something else. And I go and I get a violin out of the trunk. What I did instead <laughs> was we, someone said camping and I was like, yes, that's what we're doing. Went and got the tent, started throwing it around and everyone was like, what's going on? What's happening? Meg and Kathy are backstage, have no idea what's happening. They don't know something's gone wrong. I think um, Mike gets backstage and is like, we're doing the wrong scene. We're doing the wrong scene. Um, so we did the camping scene. And then over the course of the three or four scenes amount of time we had to get to the gap where the camping scene now was, because we already done it, we had to try and figure out a way to work in the violin scene. Um, <laughs> I, my, my the most fa- traumatising thing I've ever done. <laughs> my favourite thing about that was getting to the end of the violin scene and realising we'd done everything that followed from the violin scene and having to then tie the end of the violin scene to the end of the camping scene five scenes later. And all of us sat there like, you've messed this up now, Nathan, haven't you? <laughs> who knows where we're going and just watching all three of us be like we're making this up but that's i mean that's but that's also that's part of the fun of the way that they're written that it's it sort of as long as everything happens very much in three men in a boat it was such an anecdotal show and it's it's based on it's, it's actually probably more closely based on the book than any of my other shows um it's so it's based on the book which is anecdotal it sort of didn't matter if you dipped into one thing and then dropped out of it so that was fine i mean it probably wasn't as yeah it it wasn't the end of the world i mean lots of things happened there was that there was that day in three men in a boat when um i wasn't brought a knife to peel potatoes with so i ended up having (laughs) to peel potatoes with my mouth um, which ended oh. up, but it, it ended up being part of the show, and it wasn't until the end of that performance where Kathy came up to me and went, "You know, potatoes are poisonous, don't you?" And I was like, "Are they?" What? And she was like, "Yeah, if you if you eat raw potatoes, it's not very good for you." And I was like, "It's a good thing I didn't swallow them." No, I think it's just like you get the runs, but no, nice. yeah. <laughs> And on that note, <laughs> and on that note, thank you very much for joining the podcast. No, um, <laughs> um, yeah, Ollie, what what about you? What's the what's the most unexpected thing that's happened to you during a show? Um, I got hired <laughs> <laughs> during a show. Um, I mean, technically, yeah, I did get hired as like a stage manager because I had to sit in the gazebo and make sure I didn't fly away. So. <laughs> Um, and the amount of times that we've been like, Ollie, can you bring <laughs> the duct tape with you when you're coming? <laughs> like, <laughs> almost every show. <laughs> They're not lying. Um, uh, probably the most unexpected thing was um, probably not during a show, but um, so for uh, Joe's or IKP's panto, even. Um, Joe got about halfway through the tour and realised that um, COVID restrictions were making it very difficult to um, hire someone new uh, that wasn't involved in the company already, who wasn't already exposed to these people. Um, so he asked me to do the, <laughs> he asked me to help out with the costume changes and the tech. And I have no experience in tech or costume changes whatsoever. And so, um, yeah, I was during during the Cinderella Panto, which was outdoors, by the way, and was in December. So cold. It was all right for the actors because they were moving about, but I was just sat in a tent <laughs> in the middle of a field and probably like minus one, two degrees, freezing my ass off, um, trying to make sure that I was clicking all the right cues whilst also changing everyone into costumes. So I would be at the at the end of a tent putting Ruben, who was um, Buttons and one of the ugly sisters in Cinderella, into his costume. And then 
realizing that I had a cue, <laughs> so ru- ran to the other side of the tent just to press a space bar to play the cue to then run back and change them again. So that was probably like the most uh, unexpected thing for me to happen to me because uh, I never want to do it again. So. <laughs> So uh, it looks like we're coming to the end of our time for this week's podcast, um, but it's been great having uh, the three of you with me, Nate, Kirsten and Ollie. Um, and moving on next week, we're going to have a different host each week. So somebody else is going to take the reins and introduce a topic that they want to talk about um, and something to do with IKP that we can discuss moving forward, which is particularly interesting at the moment because uh, it looks like sometime in the near future, theatre might be coming back which is great and we cannot Ooh. wait um so that so that'll be great um so next week we will put out an episode and kirsten's going to be the host so i'm looking forward to hearing what kirsten wants to introduce um and and what we're going to talk about good night <laughs>